seen in this country in the last 20 or 30 years is a concentration in the industry where a very few companies are producing the vast majority of animals. Um, it's because this, the deck is stacked against small family farmers, sustainable farms. Um, everything from subsidies to the lobbying power of these giant companies uh, to politicians that have basically been bought off to support them to allow more and more consolidation of the industry. Um, the profit margin is very high for these companies and the more animals they can produce, the more money they make. And of course, the more animals they produce, they crowd out the market for smaller producers who can't get their products to the market. And we've just seen continually more and more concentration in this vertically integrated market, which means the big companies own the animals from the time they're born to the time they end up on the supermarket shelf. Uh, it's a very efficient system for them, and it's, uh, like I said, very profitable, and it knocks a lot of the smaller producers out of the, out of the market. Well, a CAFO, a factory farm, is essentially a feedlot. It's a feeding operation. Uh, they've gotten bigger, they've gotten more mechanized, they've gotten more high tech. Um, and of course, the more technology advances, the more animals you can cram into one space at a time. But uh, a feedlot generally means a place where you feed cattle before they go to slaughter. Um, but now you could, you could say that these pig farms and these chicken farms are also a form of feedlot. They're, they're feeding operations. Well, when you have thousands of animals concentrated into one single place, you obviously generate enormous amounts of waste. And it's typically more waste than the surrounding land can absorb. There's far too many nutrients in that waste to apply on the field. So they need to store it somewhere. Typically, they put them in these large lagoons. They can be up to 11, 12 acres, many millions of gallons. And that just sits there and it festers. And it can off-gas uh, ammonia, methane, hydrogen sulfide, not to mention dangerous pathogens. And that is the problem. It's the difference between a concentrated animal feeding operation where you have thousands of animals in one place and a more sustainable operation where the animals are out on pasture. They uh, urinate and defecate on the pasture, which goes to fertilize it, but at a much more sustainable level. Um, it's a much more closed system that way, whereas in the factory farm system, you, you concentrate the animals, you concentrate the waste, and then you have to dispose of the waste. And that's one of the biggest problems with factory farming. There are some technologies that have been developed to prevent things like off-gassing. Um, there are some alternative technologies being developed to actually process the manure in a, in a more biodegradable way, if you will. There are processes where you can separate the liquid out and take the solids. I went to one farm where they're putting them in these trenches filled with earthworms, and the worms eat the manure and turn it into very healthy, clean compost, and every day they add another inch of, com of waste on top, and the worms keep eating it. Um, and for the liquid side, they've actually, actually come up with ways to uh, sterilize the water to, to get the, the um, particulate matter out of it, and then they can use that water over for irrigation. Some people claim you can even drink it. I uh, decline to, to give that a try. Um, there's also um, covers for lagoons that some people use. Um, in one place in Indiana, the gases built up under the cover, which is a, a plastic rubber uh, type uh, of material, and a giant bubble actually formed, and there was a lot of worry that it was going to explode. And they had to send men out there and, and, and basically pierce the bubble to let the gas escape. So um, typically lagoons are not covered, and typically very little is done to, to prevent this off-gassing. Yes, they are. Um, if these factory farms are discharging uh, pollutants into the water, they're supposed to have a permit for that. They, they can get a permit under the Clean Water Act, unfortunately. Um, so what they're doing right now is essentially legal, um, although there have been lawsuits challenging this, and some of them have been successful, that, that they are in violation of the Clean Water Act because the discharges are exceeding their permit, for example. Um, so there are some laws on the books, state by state, to control these types of uh, effluents, uh, but they're not particularly effective, and as we know, they're, they're, they're certainly not universal because we do see a lot of um, spills from lagoons and we still have the off-gassing, and then of course when they take that water out of the lagoon, they use it to spray their fields, and it's not really used as fertilizer, it's a waste disposal system, and I've seen farmers spraying their fields
so much that they get saturated and that that then runs off into creeks and streams causing algae blooms. Um, so whatever the regulations say, a lot of these farms still continue to pollute. There is a difference between the different types of waste, between cattle, pick, chickens, and pigs. Um, they each have their own particular evils. Um, I believe that pig waste is considered the most uh, dirty, if you will, for lack of a better word. Pig waste probably has the most nutrients and the most pathogens in it. Uh, chicken waste is notorious because it's very, very high in nitrogen. Uh, very often higher than, again, what the soil can absorb. So you can only apply a small amount of chicken waste uh, to land. Uh, cattle waste, I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with, but um, the, uh, the pig waste is, is considered the most hazardous. And one other thing that is going on in, in places like New York State, where I live, uh, the state is helping subsidize um, anaerobic digesters that can take the waste and uh, basically extract the methane from it and use that for energy. They can turn that into energy. And then you still, of course, have to deal with the waste that's left behind, but it does help compost the waste to a certain extent. And it generates uh, sustainable energy. I'll say that cattle grazing is environmentally hazardous. It's not good for the environment. They not only trample the ground and, and, and pull up vegetation, but uh, there is runoff into creeks and streams, uh, or they'll go into the creeks and streams. So whether you're raising cattle on pasture or raising them in a, a confined uh, operation, uh, they're both problematic. But again, in a confined operation, the sheer volume is so much higher. Even though it's being stored in a lagoon, um, the chances of, of runoff or overspill are much greater. But if EPA is going after the smaller ranchers, it's because they are polluting the water. Well, nitrogen rain comes from the ammonia that off-gasses from these lagoons. It goes up in the air and it forms clouds. Those clouds can actually travel up to 50 miles away and it'll come back down into the water, not in the form of rain, but the ammonia will go into the water and it turns into nitrates from the ammonia. And that can lead to um, algae blooms, and also that depletes the water of oxygen, which in turn leads to massive fish, fish kills. These lagoons really do stink. And when I was out in the Midwest and in North Carolina and Washington State, depending on which way the wind is blowing, uh, it can emit and move vast amounts of these gases. Again, ammonia, methane, and particularly hydrogen sulfide, uh, which is, um, what stinks, um, you know, it's, it's the same that's in, in human gas. <clears throat> when you pass gas, that's what you smell is the hydrogen sulfide. And um, it can cause not only respiratory problems, uh, sore throats, uh, sinus issues, watery eyes, but it can lead to mental issues as well, depression, even aggression. Um, and people who live near these farms uh, have reported uh, mental health issues and f lots of physical health issues because they're breathing this air that's just so foul. I think the United States is probably the leading factory farm country in the world, but we're seeing these farms coming now to places like Mexico, Brazil, China, and extensively in Eastern Europe, particularly in Poland and other countries in Eastern Europe. So the technology is being exported uh, to other companies, countries, often by U.S. companies that have subsidiaries, uh, for example, in Mexico. Uh, so it is starting to spread around the world. A lot of times if there's oversaturation of the soil, or sometimes there is even leakage from the bottom of these lagoons, you know, sometimes they're lined with clay, but not always. And those pathogens and those nitrates can seep into the ground and actually reach the aquifer, uh, which is used for drinking water. And if you have a certain level of nitrates in the water, it can lead to a couple of serious health issues. One of them is so-called blue baby syndrome, where it depletes the oxygen in a young child and they actually turn blue. And if not treated, it, it can lead to death. Uh, high nitrates in the water have also been associated with an increased risk for diabetes and, and other uh, ailments. I don't think the EPA is living up to its um, statutory uh, obligations as a federal agency in many ways, particularly when it comes to the Clean Water Act. Um, there's many times when they simply don't enforce the law. 
and that causes people to file what are called citizens lawsuits, which is a provision of the Clean Water Act. Uh, you notify a polluter 60-day uh, uh, intent to sue them under the Clean Water Act. If they don't fix it in 60 days, then you can go to court. Uh, the EPA should be doing that. It shouldn't be left to citizens to have to mount these kinds of legal challenges, but that's what's going on because the EPA uh, fails so often at the, their job. There have been successful lawsuits under the Clean Water Act, uh, which I mentioned in the book, particularly in Washington State. Uh, local residents sued, I think it was 10 mega dairy farms, and, and they won. And uh, what happened was they got money to do groundwater studies, which then proved that there were nitrates in the drinking water. Uh, some of these dairies, some closed down altogether. Others um, did do take measures to try to prevent less seepage into uh, waterways, such as barriers between where you spray the effluent and, and creeks. Um, and uh, it has improved the situation somewhat. Well, raising animals is very different than raising fruits or vegetables. Um, I've even seen in New York supermarkets, I'll walk by a supermarket and somebody will come up in a pickup truck and unload watermelons that they grew themselves. Those watermelons need no processing, no nothing. You just take them from the farm, you sell them directly to the supermarket. Obviously, you can't do that with milk, with eggs, or certainly not with meat. Uh, they, they need to be processed. And it used to be that there were many, many processing plants in rural areas, and farmers could actually pick and choose where they wanted to sell their animals. Whatever plant was giving the best price on the day that they wanted to take their animals in for slaughter, they could. But with this consolidation of the industry, these companies not only own the animals and own the food that's being sold in the stores, they now own the majority of the processing plants, which have become much bigger, they're mechanized, and they want, say, 5,000 pigs delivered at Wednesday at five o'clock. They want those pigs to all be the exact same size, the exact same shape, because the machines are calibrated to slaughter that type of animal and it's much more efficient for them, that blocks out the smaller producers. And if they can't get their animals to a processing plant, they can't sell those products. And uh, so it's a chokehold, it's like an hourglass. You have all this production up here, you have all this demand down there, but to get from here to there, you have to go through a very, very narrow channel. And again, that benefits these large companies and shuts out the smaller producers. I don't know if monopoly is the right word, but it doesn't seem like it uh, enhances competition. I would say it's anti-competitive, uh, and it is, uh, I suppose, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, uh, there, there might be antitrust issues involved here, uh, certainly in terms of fairness and certainly in terms of the free market, uh, it's very, very skewed towards the large producers, and um, the system allows it, and uh, the big people benefit and the little ones suffer. Coslac is better known as bovine growth hormone, BGH, and it's a, it's a GMO product. Um, there is naturally occurring growth home hormones in, in cattle. Uh, BGH, uh, the, the synthetic version, is given to dairy cows. It makes them produce, I think, up to 30% more milk at a time. Uh, it has its own problems, though. One is it has about a 70% greater risk of infection of the udders. Uh, which is not good for the cow and it also means that cow then needs to receive a lot more antibiotics than she normally would and of course we over depend on antibiotics and we're seeing a lot of antibiotic resistance. Um, the FDA tells us that there's absolutely no difference between milk from non-treated cows and milk from treated cows. However, this product is banned in the European Union, it's banned in Canada, it's banned in a number of industrialized countries uh, it is allowed in this country. It does contain a, uh, a factor, IGF-1, which has been associated with uh, increased risk for certain types of cancers. The jury is still out whether the elevated levels of this substance in the treated milk is more uh, of a risk factor for cancer than milk without it. Uh, but some scientists, for example, in Canada, have shown that those elevated levels are more carcinogenic. From what I've read recently, the FDA still insists that that hormone, uh, even if it is in the milk, is not active in humans. So it has, the hormone itself has no impact on human health and human development. There are other people who say, we see a lot of pre uh, 
uh, premature uh, puberty, especially in girls. Uh, a lot of people think that might be a connection, not just between um, hormones used in milk, but hormones used in other animal production. Uh, the U.S. government says that's not the case. Um, I think more research is probably needed to, to find out for sure whether that is the case or not. And of course, there could be other factors at play why girls are reaching puberty at an earlier age and why they're developing breast tissue at an earlier age. There's, there's so many things in our environment that are, are wrong, and um, I think we, we just don't know the exact answer yet. The recalls from contaminated beef and, and eggs as well, I don't think is so much a, a byproduct of the use of hormones and antibiotics. Um, it has to do, A, with the living conditions of the animals when they recalled half a billion eggs, uh, I think it was back in 2000, a few years ago, I don't remember the exact year, uh, half a billion eggs were found to be infected with salmonella, and that's because the living conditions of these laying hens were so atrocious and so filthy that they got sick and they passed that disease on to their eggs, and then the eggs become contaminated. Uh, in terms of E. coli, there is some research that suggests that when you feed cattle uh, soybeans and corn and other grains, of course, cattle are ruminants. They're supposed to eat grass. They weren't evolved to eat grains. And when you feed them this, it can increase the risk for E. coli. They also feed them grains that have already been used for distilleries. And what's left over after you remove the alcohol, you give that grain to the animals. And that also increases the likelihood of dangerous E. coli. Um, so that's one reason why we're seeing these, these types of problems. On most um, farms that produce eggs these days, uh, the hens are kept in tiny, tiny cages, often no bigger than a piece of paper. So she can barely stand up, she can barely turn around in that space. Uh, she's confined there and it's all mechanized. There's two conveyor belts. One brings in feed, the other one carries away the eggs. Um, they're not allowed to move. They spend their entire lives in that tiny little space just producing eggs every single day. You, you of course, don't need a rooster to produce eggs. Um, that's why they're not fertile. Um, okay. So uh, the only place you would need a rooster is in a facility that's breeding chickens to become laying hens. And of course, all the males born in those facilities are immediately destroyed because there's no place for a male chicken in an egg farm. Um, I believe that the hens are artificially inseminated these days. I don't think they just let them run around with roosters. You have more control that way, obviously, and you don't need to deal with the roosters. You just inseminate the hens. Foie gras, I don't think was in my book. It, it, it might have been. That's not typically done on a, in a factory farm setting. Okay. It's done in a smaller setting, but it's, it's a horrible thing where the geese are, are constrained and with a, a tube, uh, or, or something like it. They, they keep force feeding it. The idea is to get the liver as fatty as you possibly can before you, you kill the goose and, and take the liver. Uh, it's considered an extremely inhumane practice. That's why I believe it's been outlawed in the state of California and possibly in other places. Um, certainly animal welfare uh, advocates uh, are extremely opposed to this practice because it's very, very hard on the bird, obviously, and very unhealthy. It is very barbaric, and if you've seen it either in person or on videos and photographs, it's, it's heart-wrenching to see uh, these female pigs that are kept in these crates. They can barely stand up. The bars are pressing against their flesh. Um, and then once they give birth, the piglets are removed, and they're kept outside the crate so that the mother won't roll over and kill them accidentally. Um, and she is kept in that crate her entire life. And as soon as she has one litter, and that litter is weaned and taken off to a factory farm, she's impregnated again. And again, these crates are kept indoors. She never breathes fresh air. She never sees the light of day. She never gets to go out on pasture. Uh, she never gets to forage. All these things that, that pigs and other animals evolved to do. So they're even cut off from a social life. They're cut off from their own young and they are confined in this incredibly small space. As for the veal calves, again, on a dairy farm, there's no place for males. You, you, again, everything is artificially inseminated uh, and males don't produce milk. So the second they're born, they're snatched away from their mothers and given formula, and then they're put in what are called hutches, 
which is basically like a tiny little kennel, often with a hole uh, so that the animal can breathe fresh air, stick his nose out and get some air. But they're, they're often tethered as well. They can't turn around. They can't move at all. That's because Americans like veal because it's white and tender. Uh, and you don't want that calf to develop any type of muscle tissue. Uh, you're trying to preserve that very tender uh, white veal meat, and so they prevent the calf from getting any exercise before they slaughter it. When chickens are slaughtered, uh, typically they're taken and they're tied up by their, their feet upside down and they're lowered into electrified water, which stuns them uh, so that they, they can then be slaughtered more easily. I do write about animal welfare a lot these days. I write for a website called takepark.com. I typically write about wildlife and issues affecting wildlife as well as the environment, but I do also write about how factory farming affects the environment, uh, the air and the water and the soil. Um, this book, Fact uh, Animal Factory, was my second book. My third book uh, was called Death at SeaWorld, so it's sort of tangentially related because that's about the uh, keeping of killer whales in captivity and what it does to them. And there's an interesting parallel there because killer whales, of course, are enormous. And in the wild, they can swim up to 100 miles a day. But at a place like SeaWorld, just down the road here in Orlando, they're kept in basically what amounts to a swimming pool. And that leads to an incredible amount of stress and health issues for them. Uh, they, they die earlier, they become much more aggressive, they attack people, which they never do in a while. So even though farm animals have been domesticated for hundreds if not thousands of years, it still has the same effect when you confine an animal to a very, very small space. It's going to impact its health, it's going to impact uh, its well-being. So I, I, I'm very interested in, in animal issues. It's not particularly my, my only thing that I write about, and in fact, the book I'm working on right now has nothing to do with any of these issues. Uh, I'm working on a book about the erosion of constitutional rights in this country. So this is something that, that affects people. Um, everything from uh, having your assets seized by the government to having your house raided unnecessarily without police warrants to having your children taken away because the government thinks you're not raising them properly uh, to being strip searched. Um, stop and frisk, um, all the things that are happening all over the country today to ordinary citizens going about their lives, often without committing a single crime and yet being drawn into the system and, and having their lives turned upside down by overzealous government officials. That's where farming, and not necessarily factory farming, but ranching has an enormous impact on wildlife, whether it's wild mustangs or wolves, uh, cattle ranchers lease federal land to graze their cattle at a very, very low rate. And of course, there's wildlife uh, that competes with them. In the state of Washington, they just ordered the eradication of an entire pack of wolves, endangered wolves, I might add, because farmers were complaining that they were killing their cattle. Um, the cattle shouldn't be on national forest land that is a natural habitat for animals like wolves and other predators. Um, you don't put cattle where predators belong. And if you do, you should be prepared to suffer the consequences of losing animals. You shouldn't be allowed to then just go out and kill endangered species because they're chipping away at the profit margin of a rancher who is foraging his animals on public land. That land belongs to the public. Those uh, wildlife species belong to the public. It's in the public's interest to preserve them, particularly the endangered ones, and yet they're the ones that get sacrificed so that the cattle ranchers can continue to use public lands to graze their cattle. So there is definitely a connection there between uh, animal farming and wildlife. And that's where the predators come in. Without predators, you are gonna get overpopulation of their prey. Um, and uh, by eliminating predators, you might be saving the cattle, but you're creating an imbalance in the ecosystem that took thousands and thousands of years to, to evolve. The thing that, that struck me most, other than the suffering of the animals itself, which is very, very hard to, 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 to witness, uh, is the impact on rural communities.
and the impact on families who live in these areas when a factory farm comes in. Uh, their lives are upturned as well, uh, not only dealing with uh, water pollution, polluted wells, uh, and the air that they're breathing, but their property values go down, their quality of life goes down, they can't enjoy the outside, they can't hang their laundry out to dry, uh, and it affects local economies. For example, feed trucks coming in and out tear up the roads, and the county ends up footing the bill. The taxpayers pay for that. Uh, with all the migrant workers coming through to work on these farms, there's an increase on demand for social services, for health, for education, uh, possibly for food assistance. So, uh, and they don't create that many jobs. So um, the economic and the social impact on rural communities is enormous. And most people, when they're at the supermarket, uh, they may think, oh, was this cow raised humanely or did it pollute the water? But what they're certainly not thinking about is the people who suffer tremendously when a large factory farm moves in near their home. Um, I've seen grown men, I, I've seen Iraq war veterans break down into tears talking about what happened. I, I spoke to one guy, he went to fight in Iraq. He came back, there was a hog uh, factory farm that was built right across the street from his house. And he had all these problems, falling property values, not being able to use the outside, dealing with health issues. And he broke down and cried, a, a grown man. Um, it, uh, it ruins families, it, it, it ruins uh, households. And very few of them can successfully get any kind of compensation for those types of losses. We're consumers and we're voters and we're citizens. As consumers, we can eat less meat or no meat, or we can try to source meat, eggs, and dairy that are sustainably raised, that come from local farms that were grown organically. The consumer has a lot more power than, than they realize. And if people started, even if it took more money to put food on your table, the more you buy sustainably or locally, the less people are buying from these large mechanized farms, which would reduce the profits of these companies and, and make factory farming eventually less attractive to them. So consumers have a lot more power than they realize. Um, as voters, you can certainly try to vote in or campaign for candidates at the, at the county level, at the state level, at the federal level, who are more concerned about environmental degradation fair uh, rural community development um, they, they tend to be more progressive um, although there are certainly plenty of Democrats who support the factory farming system um, so I'm not saying that uh, it's one party over the other necessarily but um, if you are an environmental voter this is certainly something that you would want to keep into account and when you're looking at two different candidates who has a better record uh, environmentally in general and particularly in terms of regulating things like factory farms. And then as citizens there's things you can do such as launch a citizens lawsuit under the Clean Water Act. You can organize locally, you can uh, try to change zoning laws, uh, you can work to try to just uh, change public opinion both among lawmakers and the public in general uh, to raise awareness, to let people know that this is going on to uh, describe the problems that this type of farming is creating and hopefully to create a better environment where we would have stricter re uh, regulations and where um, factory farms would be um, certainly better neighbors and, and more environmentally friendly and possibly eventually move us away from this concentrated model and back to a more diversified uh, system of small sustainable family farms. A lot of this fight does go on at the local level. Um, the problem is, I think all 50 states have what are called right to farm laws, and I believe those preempt local zoning ordinances. So I'm not sure in many states if uh, local communities can basically outlaw factory farms coming in. They can regulate them, they, they do have um, permitting uh, power, uh, but I don't think they can outright stop these farms from coming in. But there are things that can be done at the local level. A lot is done at the state level. And the federal government can get involved too. The EPA, the USDA. President Obama had a 
long list of promises for rural reform that would also um, would have helped uh, sustain family farms at the expense of the factory farming system, but he uh, really didn't follow through with very many of those promises. But the federal government does have a lot of power in regulating some of these things, particularly in terms of clean water and clean air. Uh, also things such as um, uh, the processing plants, I believe the USDA has some say over that. So, um, you know, it's, um, you choose your battles carefully, but a lot of this is done at the local level. There's one type of, of CAFO, of factory farming, that I didn't discuss, and that's fish farms. And I didn't know very much about fish farms when I researched this book, but when I did the book on killer whales and I went to British Columbia and I saw these giant salmon farms that um, unusually enough are owned mostly by Norwegian companies that take Atlantic salmon and farm them in the Pacific Ocean. And it is extremely problematic. Um, these fish often have a lot of diseases, viruses, sea lice, and when the wild salmon migrate and they go past these fish farms, it infects them and it's killing off wild fish. Um, those wild fish, those wild salmon, are what sustain wild stocks of killer whales in particular, which in Washington State and British Columbia are endangered and threatened because the salmon supply is um, so little, partly because of these fish farms. Um, also, um, seals, dolphins, all kinds of marine mammals depend on salmon, and these salmon farms are helping eradicate uh, once very, very bountiful stocks of wild salmon that, that sustain uh, these predators. Um, uh, going along with that is, is river dams, which um, uh, don't have much to do with farming, although they do, because those dams are created to create irrigation water for farms in the area. And there's a big effort right now to remove the four dams in the Snake River, which is home to Chinook salmon, which is the number one source of food for killer whales in the Pacific Ocean. And um, those Chinook are endangered themselves, and they're dwindling because we're taking this water and we're damming it for irrigation and for hydroelectric power. Um, and there is a push now to, to uh, remove these dams. Uh, Two dams in Washington State on the Elwha River were just taken down, and the salmon runs are coming back within a matter of years. Um, nature has a very uncanny way of rebounding. So if we were to get rid of the salmon farms, we would see salmon stocks coming back. If we were to take down these dams that support agriculture, uh, we would see the salmon stocks come back, and that would be enormously beneficial, uh, particularly to endangered species like killer whales. I have to admit I gave very little thought to where my food comes from before I started researching this book. I didn't know what a factory farm was. I, I really thought that the eggs came from Farmer Brown down the road with the chickens clucking and scratching in the dirt and that all beef and dairy came from cows out on pasture and pigs rolling around in mud um, on a family farm. Uh, obviously that's not the case, uh, like we said, the vast majority of our animal protein comes from an industrial scale operation, uh, people need to, to educate themselves and make themselves aware. I've always said that the supermarket put up photographs of where those animals were raised. If you had organic food over here in this aisle and you had chickens and pigs out on the pasture doing what animals do, and then you had the commercially produced food and pictures of factory farms, I think most people would move over <laughs> to the other aisle. So awareness, education, um, people I think are compassionate. I think if they, they knew the harm this was causing to the animals, to the environment, to wildlife, and to human beings that live near these facilities, they would think twice. Now, it's difficult in today's economy to feed a family. When you go to the supermarket, your natural inclination is to probably buy the most economical or the highest value um, you can. And again, because of farm subsidies, that's why we have such cheap meat in this country. And because our meat is so cheap, we eat more of it than we probably should. So it may sound cruel in a way to say, but if meat prices were higher, we would eat less of it. And if we had less of it, we would need to produce less of it. And then we would have less of these problems that these factory farms are creating. So, you know, um, 
reduction in, in meat consumption is a very good idea, not only for your own health, but um, for the environment. And there's practical things you can do. If you're cooking dinner, instead of making one chicken breast for each person, four chicken breasts, you take one chicken breast, you slice it up, and you saute it with vegetables, and you make a meal out of it that way. You're using one fourth the amount of meat than you normally would, and you still have a very wholesome uh, and delicious uh, uh, dinner, but you're using less meat. So consumers need to just realize the footprint that they themselves are leaving when they eat a steak, when they eat bacon, when they have a glass of milk. Um, it had to come from somewhere. And if it didn't come from a sustainable operation, smaller scale, um, diversified family farm, it came from a factory farm. And if it came from a factory farm, there is collateral damage uh, in the creation of that product. Um, the other thing that we didn't mention is the huge amounts of water that these facilities use. So you're also depleting another natural resource, water, which is becoming more and more scarce as we know in many parts of the country.